heaven above on earth and under the earth. For you have been given the name that is above every other name. And that your name, let every knee bow. Let every tongue confess that you are Lord. Have dominion over this assembly. And let your glory fill this tabernacle. By the power of your might, move among us. Speak to us. Lord, we are ready to hear you. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. Your Grace, the Dean of the Church of Nigeria, Your Graces, the Archbishops, Mama Nigeria, the bishops and the wives of the archbishops and bishops. Your Excellency, Professor Charles Soludo, the Executive Governor of Anambra State. The Chancellor of the Church of Nigeria and the Chancellors of the Diocese of the Church of Nigeria, the Registrar of the Church of Nigeria, and the Registrars and other legal officers of the Church of Nigeria. Standing on the existing protocols already established, I welcome you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God, the owner and builder of his church for his loving kindness that has sustained us as his people in spite of the merits of challenges facing the church and the world. God has been our divine helper and in the face of uncertainties he is saying to us fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, yes. I will help you, for I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Behold, all those who were incensed against you shall be ashamed and disgraced. God has brought us to this 14th General Synod that guided by His Holy Spirit we shall take decisions that will be pleasing to Him and will also guide the missions and ministry of the church. At the 13th General Synod we focus on the priority of God for his church in this decade of the reign of God. And in this 14th General Synod, we shall focus on building and strengthening this faith in Christ Jesus through the missions and ministries of the church. The word of God will remain the bedrock of all we do. 
we appreciate the hospitality of the bishop, clergy, and laity of the Diocese of Newi, and the warm welcome we have enjoyed in this province of the Niger. May I here also appreciate the hospitality and care of His Excellency, Professor Soludo. Thank you for being there for us. God bless you. We welcome everyone to this 14th General Synod of the Church of Nigeria. In the name of the Triune God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The state of the nation and the political landscape. The new administration. We congratulate the new administration of His Excellency Alhaji Ola Tinibu the President and Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and his Vice President, Alhaji Kashim Shetima. We thank God for preserving this country as one united country despite the policies of the last eight years which were lopsided favoring the Fulani and Muslims, this anomaly nearly tore the fabric of Nigeria's unity because we had never been so segregated as we have it today. As a result of this glaring lopsidedness, the past administration of General Muhammadu Buhari left much to be desired no matter the party that would have come to power there would be no magic to stem the tide of the untold hardship that would come the stage was set for the removal of the fuel subsidy through the non-budgetary provision and since May 29, 2023, the citizens of this nation have faced indescribable and unbearable hardship, resulting from the removal of the petroleum subsidy and the corresponding hike in petrol price without corresponding measures to push on the effects on the citizens. The new administration of President Tinubu must be proactive in providing the so much desired good governance and welfare for Nigerians. Issues of security, economy, health, education, and a clear roadmap for industrialization, technological advancement, and the rule of law must be clearly set out. Nigerians are longing for the birth of a new, a new Nigeria. We commend the new cabinet of President Ahmed Tinubu and commend the assemblage of the team that we decry the continued marginalization that the southeastern geopolitical zone in the appoint political appointments are still suffering. The notwithstanding, this notwithstanding, we commend the efforts of the administration to be more intentional in giving opportunities to every section and interest in the country. The tendency to keep recycling the old politicians 
who have looted and vandalized our economy and perfected violence and corruption as tools for leadership must stop. While we commend some of the appointments into the Federal Executive Council, we insist that those whose character and conduct have much to be desired must be dropped. There is need to give more opportunity to women and young people in order to kickstart the emergence of a new team of leaders for Nigeria. The church yearns for a rebirth of our nation through the deepening of the roots of, the, of our democracy and intentionally growing a transformational political ideology. Nigeria demands a political leadership that will respect the rights, welfare, and the quality of all tribes and component groups and build a united people and a thriving nation where no person is oppressed. Others, please, when you get the, uh, the address, you will see all that in full. Our economy, our economy has suffered so many setbacks and the common man on the street is economically battered. The prices of goods and services continue to increase in indiscriminately and workers cannot afford the cost of transportation to work. With a GDP of over $477 billion, Nigeria's finance financial economy is unarguably the largest in Africa. Unfortunately, it is obvious that all is not well with the Nigerian economy. The double-digit inflation rate continued its upward trajectory while interest rates also arose also rose. Floating the Naira in June 2023, as good as the intention was, has further devalued our Naira from 462 Naira per dollar to 740, more than 740 Naira in the official market and from 762 Naira to 950 Naira in the parallel market. We demand that the monetary and fiscal authorities must be in synergy to stem the, the volatility of our money in the market. Failure to, subs to Stabilize this market coupled with its with issues of transparency will obviously continue to serve as a distinct as a disincentive to our much needed foreign investors. When you get the address, you will see all the other information that we acknowledge the government's efforts to alleviate efforts of alleviating the sufferings of the Nigerians through the provision of palliatives. But we must say that the measures are grossly inadequate and not sustainable. We therefore tax the government to be bold and courageous in rethinking their decision. With the country's debt at $85 billion, it is gratifying to note government's current stance that borrowing 
will no longer be business as usual. Mr. President's charge to his ministers to find creative ways of generating funds to run their operations in the economy because of our current economic realities is indeed timely and commendable. But we must caution that borrowing is good, but we cannot continue to borrow at the expense of our future generation. Insecurity. Insecurity has become a challenge. Nigerians have lost their homes, livelihood, their lives, and indeed their property. We are constantly under attack in our own nation. And in some parts of our diocese, our churches have been vandalized and destroyed. Our members have been continually been kidnapped. And the persons are killed violently by sudden attacks by unidentified men. The recent attacks in different parts of this country, in the north, in the south, in the west, in the east, are very disturbing. The lives of, uh, of Nigerians, irrespective of their religion, tribe, class, or other considerations, matter to God and to this nation. The factors causing insecurity must be addressed. The incidences of military coups, coup d'etat, in West Africa and South and Central African countries are a cause for concern. Nigeria should not be involved in any military armed intervention in Niger. Niger, if you do not know, please note this. Niger is an extension of the northwest of Nigeria. Because historically, a good part of Niger as a country is under the Sokoto Caliphate. Any military intervention in Niger will steer the feelings and the emotions of the Muslims and this will aggravate the already bad security situation in Nigeria. I want to tell you that all the Achaba you saw, most of them are from Niger. Those of them walking around our states in the south here, rarely will you see a typical northern Hausa Muslim. Most of them are Nigerians. So, if you go and fight them and kill, and you, it will worsen our situation here. It will be a free-for-all fight. And so, our government must not allow the United States, sorry, there must be a diplomatic solution and negotiated settlement to the political impulse in Niger. Our government must not allow the United States of America as well as the European Union to use Nigeria to do their dirty job in Niger. Instead of pursuing the war against the military junta in Niger, Nigeria should negotiate to be a member of BRICS, the Emerging New Economic Bloc. This will open new economic frontiers and ensure our non-allied nation posture as a country. This will be our honest suggestion. Japan, 
the mass exodus of our young professionals, professional population, and the future of Nigeria. The current mass exodus of our professionals and the young people is worrisome. The political, economic, and security situations in the country show that our young people have little to hope for in Nigeria. This perception must be changed such that those who desire to go out of Nigeria will do so by choice and not because of frustration. This problem of brain drain and depopulation of the most productive workforce of our nation needs to be addressed. Nigeria needs a new constitution as the foundation for a stronger future. We commend the National Assembly on their efforts to review the present constitution. What we need is a totally new constitution made by a sovereign representation of the ethnic nationalities of this country. The current constitution has limitations that hinder the nation's growth and stability. This new constitution must reflect the nation's identity and diversity and be a unifying force that recognizes and protects our diversity. It must strengthen federalism and decentralization. The current constitution's uni unitary tendencies limit the autonomy of the state governments. We need a new constitution that would reinforce true federalism, granting states more powers to address local challenges and drive development initiatives. This new constitution should prioritize social justice, ensuring equitable distribution of resources and opportunities by focusing on poverty alleviation, education, health care, and job creation. Our constitution must enshrine the protection of the fundamental human rights and guarantee the rule of law with an independent judiciary. We need a new constitution that will prioritize policies that empower the youth, promote gender equality, and the breaking down of barriers that impede women's participation in politics, business, and other spheres of public life. The venue of our General Synod, the brief history is contained on pages 10 to 12, that Christianity first came to this place in 1893 that did not thrive, that was replanted in 1902. And this church is the home church of some of our revered church leaders and fathers, notable among whom is the late Right Reverend Lucius Uzodike, revered father of this church, and also the present bishop of Newe, Ndubisi Ubi. We want to appreciate your hospitality and that which you have exerted for us. God bless you. When you get the charge or the address, please, you can read the rest. Our theme 
Arise and build God's mandate for God's people in a broken world. Nehemiah 2, 17 and 18. In the Hebrew manuscripts, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah are put together as one book. Both Ezra and Nehemiah were contemporaries. While Nehemiah served as governor, Ezra served as priest and scribe. And both worked in the period of the return and the rebuilding of the Jews from exile. The book of Nehemiah was an autobiography. Nehemiah lived out the meaning of his name, which was the comfort of Yahweh. He was a public servant and a confidant of King Ataxazis as a cupbearer or an ADC to the king. He was a lame man who loved, feared, and served God and whose personal faith in Yahweh guided his public service and personal conduct. He was a man who loved the people and was concerned for the plight of the Jews, especially those who remained in Jerusalem after the captivity. He was a true exalt. There was a delegation led by Hanani their report on the state of the, the state of Judah was summed up thus: the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jericho is broken down, and its gates and and its gates are burned with fire. Two things weighed heavily on Nehemiah, the welfare of the Jews and the devastation and dilapidation as well as the insecurity of Jerusalem and Judah. His first task was to return and rebuild Jerusalem and Judah. So his first task was to challenge and mobilize his fellow Jews to arise and rebuild the devastations and broken walls of Jerusalem. There were great oppositions and sabotage from within and outside. But through the faith in the living God, the cooperation and the teamwork of the ordinary people, the great work of rebuilding the wall of, Jer of Jerusalem was completed in 52 days. This achievement was evidently the, by the help of the Almighty God. The greater task was in restoring and transforming the people. By contrast, the task of reviving and restoring the people of God within the rebuilt wall of Jerusalem demanded more years of Nehemiah's godly life and leadership. The book of Nehemiah stands out as a rich resource in godly leadership and service to God and humanity, especially in challenging times. And what can be more challenging than the times we live in Nigeria today? The word of the Lord and the, and the mandate of God to the church and to all God's people is arise and build. As it was in the days of Nehemiah, there is the need for the believers in Christ and indeed all citizens in Nigeria to be mobilized to build back what the enemy seeks to destroy. This 
is God's mandate. The call of God is for us to rise up from where we are beaten down to a higher pedestal to awake from our slumber, our complacency, and our despondency through God's own enablement and build and rebuild what is about to die. This drives home our need of total dependence on God and for his guidance in this precarious time in the life of the church and our nation. The broken walls of Jerusalem, our broken wall. The devastations of Jerusalem were occasioned by sin, disobedience, and unfaithfulness of the people to the living God and his word and commandments. The physical destruction was symptomatic of the deep spiritual, religious, moral, and socio-economic and political corruption of the people. All that, all the true prophets and servants of God before the fall of Jerusalem and Judah, during the exile, and at the verge of return of the exile, declared clearly that the devastations were as a consequence of Israel's sin and wickedness. Yet, within the severe visitation of judgment of God, we see God's mercy shining through. There was a ray of hope and God's promise of restoration within the darkness of sin and agony. God spoke to Israel of the blessings of obedience and the severe consequence of disobedience as we see in Leviticus chapter 26 and in the book of Deuteronomy. These warnings were accomplished when God brought Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, to destroy Judah and Jerusalem and carry away the people into exile in Babylon according to the word of God by the prophets, especially Jeremiah. Both Daniel and Nehemiah acknowledged the righteous judgment of God upon Israel. And they both fasted, prayed, and sought God for God's mercy, saying, We have acted very corruptly against you, and have kept and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. The inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem we are getting used to the ruins and the violations. Indeed, abnormality was accepted as the norm. The Jews in Judah and Jerusalem were acquainted with reproach and humiliation and depriving and deprivation. They were acquainted with dehumanizing conditions. One would wonder how they lived normal lives in the midst of ruins, insecurity, and death. The glory of the temple was destroyed and worship and sacrifices were stopped. The enemies had burnt the gates and broken down the walls. It was after Nehemiah had done much of a personal and thorough examination of the situation of a broken people. Not just physical broken walls that he spoke. It was to such brokenness that the word of God came to awaken the people out of, out of stupor and slumber of death. Then I said to them, 
you see the distress that we are in how Jerusalem lies in waste and its gates are burnt with fire come let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may we may no longer be a reproach there is always a serious problem and danger when the cherished moral and spiritual values are eroded and destroyed when the will of the people is broken and afflicted Nehemiah confronted what he saw with the testimony of what God was doing and he said and I told them of the hand of my God which had been good upon me and also the king's word that he had spoken to me in times of our brokenness God can use the testimony and the favor he shows to lift and bring us out of despondency and dismay. Prophet Jeremiah, in the face of the crushing experience of the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple of Jerusalem, said, remember my affliction and roaming, the one wood and the gall, my soul still remembers and sings within me. These I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. Though through the, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his, mess, his compassions fell not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. Praise God. As we are confronted by the brokenness of, of our personal lives, the family, the church, our communities, and our nation, God is speaking to us to stir up hope, to awake us, to contend and confront our challenges in his great might. The awakening. Awakening is an act of waking from sleep or an act or moment of becoming suddenly aware of something. Awakening can be from ordinary sleep or rest or socio-psychological arousing or understanding of one's situation. Nehemiah said to the people, you see the distress that we are in? They were living in, a, in denial of their present condition and reality. There was a spiritual slumber and conditions leading to death. It was an emotional condition that had to be dealt with. A social oppression and malaise that crippled the society. Spiritual awakening and re or revival is key to the turnaround God would bring because it is the realization or inspiration we receive from personal encounter with the living God, his word, and his power. When we realize and acknowledge the sovereignty of God over our lives and, all, and our denial and failure, and indeed not learning to be true to ourselves and the truth of God, there is a sudden stir to arise out of slumber and stupor to a new life and hope. We need to seek God's own solutions. It is amazing that God will 
depend on feeble and weak individuals, a broken people, to carry out and carry through the great work of rebuilding lives, structures, economies, and communities. The creativity of the human spirit in every individual, young and old, must be unlocked. As the word of God says, or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously. As Anglicans and Christians, indeed, our baptismal covenant states, we receive this person into the congregation of Christ's flock and do sign him or her with the sign of the cross in token that he or she shall not be ashamed to confess the faith of Christ crucified and to fight under his banner against sin, the world, and the devil and to continue Christ's faithful soldier and servant unto his life's end. And we say, Amen. As we are confronted by the issues of life, Apostle Paul says, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and, and labors in birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we are also, we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. It is therefore evident for the Jews who returned from exile and those who escaped the captivity and to some extent to us in Nigeria especially today that whatever we are passing through is a birth pan. It is a groaning of both the nature and the humans in great expectation of the great bringing forth of a new birth, both of the individuals and of our nation. The task of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the city of the Jebusites, which King David conquered and made the capital of the, of the United Israel. It was a, a choice place for Israel because of many factors. First, Jerusalem was the spiritual, was the spiritual significance, has the spiritual significance of Mount Moriah, which is located in it. And God said to Abraham, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him as a bond offering on the one of the land of the one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Here God tests the faith of Abraham and exchanged the life of Isaac for the ram which God provided and Abraham called the place the Lord will provide as it is said today in the mountain of the Lord it shall be provided it was on the same mount 
mountain that King Solomon built the temple of Jerusalem. In terms of, of security, Jerusalem has a natural protection of being surrounded by hills and mountains as the scripture says, those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abide forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forever. The sacredness attached to Jerusalem as the chosen city of God prefigures the heavenly Jerusalem and the eternal abode of the saints of God. Just as the psalmist said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to the testimony of Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord. Politically, the city of Jerusalem had served as capital of the Jebusites and when David conquered it, he further fortified its walls. As such, Jerusalem was significant religiously, spiritually, politically, socially, and, and socially to humanity. The Jews had so much confidence in the inviolability of Jerusalem because of its city, because it was a city chosen by God, wherein God dwells, and the temple, which was the place chosen, God chose to put his name. Prophet Jeremiah called Israel to repent of their sins and wickedness and warned them against the false confidence in the status of Jerusalem. This arrogance while living in sin and the confidence in false prophets and, prophet and promises rather than Repentance and amending their ways is the source of destruction that came to Israel and as such to humanity. Indeed, the city of Jerusalem was destroyed by Babylon and the temple was demolished because the glory of the Lord had left Prophet Ezekiel saw the failure of both the leadership of the people and the indulgence of the people in wickedness. It was the failure of the prophetic, the priestly, and the political leadership. The people of the land had used oppressions, committed robbery, and mistreated the poor and the needy, and they wrongfully oppressed the stranger. So, as the word of God says, so I sought for a man among them who would make or build a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land, on behalf of this nation and the people and the church that I should not destroy it that the Lord said, I found none. Therefore, I have poured out my indignation on them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath, and I have recompensed them their deeds on their heads, says the Lord God. God exposed the depth, the depth of the decay and the problem of Israel as he is also doing today concerning our nation Nigeria. He has sought for a man to build a wall so that the land should would be saved 
But there was none to stand to avert the wrath and destruction, eating up the land. At this time, when God searched for a man to stand on behalf of the people, will he search out whom he would send as he said to Isaiah, as I heard the voice of the Lord saying, as he sent Isaiah, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. And he said, go and tell these people, keep hearing, they do not understand. And keep on seeing, they do not perceive. In this time, in his time, God found Nehemiah and put a burden and readiness to pay the price for the task of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, rebuilding lives and family. The rebuilding of the physical walls of Jerusalem took only 52 days. But the more difficult task was the rebuilding of the lives of the people and the family. Physically, socially, morally. Destructions are caused by lives that have been destroyed spiritually. The sins of Israel are the same with the conditions that we find ourselves today as individuals, as families, and as communities and as a nation. We must rebuild lives. And if we must do that, we must take note that the process of rebuilding lives comes through repentance and faith in God and his word. This is the only way we can receive the righteousness of God that comes by faith and not our own goodness or merit or works of the law. As the scripture says clearly that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved and be delivered. And this is transformation. God requires from us not just a mental assent to creeds and religious statements, but a corresponding transformation and a change that comes from a true change of heart and our own perception or mindset. As Paul said, as Paul clearly pointed out, therefore, if anyone is in Christ. He is a new creation. All things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. Again, John the Baptist alluded to this, this transformation and change of change that befits repentance. When he encountered, encountered the Jews and confronted them for claiming of being the descendants of Abraham, which implied that they had natural favor with God. God is able to raise new people for himself, even from those who were not biologically children of Abraham. The fruit of repentance is very essential. Because even now, says the Lord, the axe 
is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is hewed down and thrown into the fire. Nigeria is a very wonderful religious nation. We contribute the greatest number of Muslims who go to Mecca. And we contribute the greatest number of Christians who go on Christian pilgrimage. And every street of Nigeria has church. You cannot pass five houses without seeing a church or ministry. But the more religious we are becoming, the more corruption and wickedness and violence you see in the land. Shedding of innocent blood. As individuals and as families, we are buffeted by many sins and disruptive behaviors and attitudes that grieve the heart of God and hinder fellowship with him. Family life and Christian marriages have never been under severe attacks as they are in our generation today. The change in the societal values have also affected the people. The present mal malady in the understanding of human sexuality which the revision revisionists have promoted and used to subvert the authority of the scripture, denying the lordship of Jesus Christ and promoting lifestyles and attitudes that are contrary to the word of God remains an error and a rebellion against God and we must stand against it. The materialism of our modern, modern life with the attendant greed and consumerism have added to the complex socio-economic and corruption challenges in the society. It must be noted that when the values garden the individual and the family life are eroded, violence and wickedness, both spiritual and social, are inevitable. The remedy is in the rebuilding of lies back to God and restoration of the godly values and the intentional return to the word of God. Rebuilding the people and rebuilding the church. Nehemiah was a people-oriented leader. And as such, he invested much in the people, mobilizing and stirring cooperation in them. He shared his vision and the the enormity of the challenges with the people and made them to own the task. Nehemiah was effective in the mobilization and carrying the people along for the rebuilding of the walls and the cities of Judah and the rebuilding of their spiritual life and worship. The rebuilding of the spiritual life of the people was key as it dealt with the root causes of the dis destruction of Judah and Jerusalem and that brought about the exile. The word of God is vital for as in the life of the individual and also in the life of the corporate community. The reading and the expounding of the word of God Corporate worship and solemn assemblies for national repentance, expression of their sorrow in fasting and prayer and prayer of confession. We are all core activities in redirecting the despondent people to the eternal purpose of God. Amen. We the welfare and the duties of the Levites and the priests were restored. The people were mobilized to carry out their religious responsibilities in bringing their tithes and offerings to the temple. 
rebuilding the spiritual fabric of the church and our society on the word of God, the worship and prayer of God's people that are rooted in the fear and the obedience to the living God is vital to addressing the challenges of our generation. Rebuilding the community and the society. It was evident that Nehemiah returned to a Jewish community that suffered insecurity, violence, and the reproach from their conquerors and captors and ruled by their enemies who dehumanized them. The very people who hated the Jews ruled over them and looted them. And in fact, if you want to ask me what is the problem of Nigeria, the problem of Nigeria is that Nigeria is being ruled by those who hated Nigeria. They have nothing, nothing at stake, except what they will get. The very, the very people who hated them, the Jews ruled over them and looted them. Tobiat and Sambalat infiltrated the Jewish local and religious leadership such that even when Nehemiah briefly returned to Shusha, Eliashib, the priest, colluded and gave to Beat accommodation within the storehouse of God, of the temple. And they looted the gifts and treasuries of the temple in such a way that that affected the welfare of the priests and the Levites and the service of the temple. Today, Nigeria suffers the pains inflicted on the people by the selfish, greedy leadership who controlled political, religious, socioeconomic lives of the nation and her resources. Nehemiah mobilized the people to see their devastation and the reproach it brought on them and the need to rise up and put an end to it. They needed to identify the real enemies of the community in the political colonization and their collaborators and their agents who infiltrated the religious establishment. We must note that the internal colonization and the oppression deplete the strength of the people hinder justice and equity and impact them socio-economically. There is the need for the religious and political leadership to consciously and intentionally work for a just and equitable society. But more so, leadership must work to tap into the potentials and the resources in the people. Rebuilding godly leadership. The book of Nehemiah presents us with great lessons in courageous leadership in challenging times. It lays down for us the principle of godly leadership that focuses on the people and their needs that demands selfless and sacrificial service to the people that is noted in strong personal faith and work with God. And as we look at Nehemiah, we can see eight distinguishing factors in godly leadership. One, personal faith and the close work with God. Two, personal commitment to prayer and the, the power of God. Three, trust in the word of God and commitment to following its teaching as guide for both personal and professional work. Four, 
compassion for the people and strong attachment to all that makes for their welfare. Five, belief in great ability and potential in the people to contribute to the task of rebuilding both the church and the nation. Six, the most effective way to lead is by being an example and practical in your living. This demands sacrifice and selflessness which are at the heart of every effective leadership, whether religious, spiritual, or political, or community. Seven, the sacrifice for service in the book of Nehemiah has an expectation for the eternal reward from God. And constantly he prayed that God will remember him. Amen. Eight, a great lesson we learn, we can learn in, the lead, in leadership in Nehemiah is how to handle oppositions, threats, attacks, betrayal from within and from without the people. Nehemiah was able to identify, separate, and deal with different oppositions without disrupting the system or losing focus of his main task. In Nehemiah, we learn how to overcome hindrances to spiritual work and, and opposition in leadership. Thus, it is said, ridicule is overcome by confidence in God. Wrath and contempt is overcome by prayer and hard work. Conspiracy is overcome by watchfulness and courage. Selfish greed is overcome by rebuke and self-sacrificing example. This will lead to work being completed and enemies being confounded by persistent endeavor. Amen. Implications. Our team, therefore, has the following implications. Number one, personal work with God, fervency in prayer, consistency in following God's instructions and word. Two, the sure foundation for spiritual transformation of the people of God is to return to the study of and the proclamation and the diligent keeping of the word of God. Three, true worship of God is built on the word of God and sanctification and renewal of covenant with God. Four, spiritual transformation through the word of God and diligence in obedience has always had a deep social, political, and economic impact. Five, Nehemiah was a pragmatic leader who took seriously the threats of oppositions and responded to their plots. He did not he did not spiritualize their plots and the enormity of the impact of, of his core task of rebuilding the war. He made adequate arrangements led by example and sacrificed his own comfort. Focused, he remained focused, consistent, sacrificial, and he made the right choices. And these are essential, especially in challenging times. Six, the people must be ready to do the right thing with God. For the welfare of the less privileged in the society, corruption and injustice must be challenged. Building a just and equitable society must be the way forward. Seven, building the lives of the people and their welfare 
is the way sustainable is the sustainable way to build structures of the society, the church and the family. And this can only be possible as the church and God's people reach out with the gospel in mission to the world that is broken. And as we do so, may God bring restoration in the name of Jesus Christ. The Church of Nigeria Matters, uh, when you get it, pages 39, 31 to 37, you will see there the proceedings from the last uh, general synod of 2020 to even this very last standing committee of the Church of Nigeria. We put a team together headed by the Dean of the Church of Nigeria, the Most Reverend Blessing, Inyinda, who worked on this. You will see all that in those pages. But let me draw our attention to our fundamental principles, the fundamental principles of this church. And uh, by this, I mean the constitution of the Church of Nigeria 2020. And uh, there we agreed that uh, there will be a three-year moratorium for any review can be done. And I am putting it before this uh, general synod. It's either we make a decision now or to extend it so that we can do this review in the next general synod or we can set the uh, things in motion so that uh, we will take decision on what to do. The moratorium stands until put it a halt. Then um, the vision of the Church of Nigeria, you will see on page 39, 38, and then for this general synod, the 14th general synod of the Church of Nigeria, we are going to do elections and the uh, elective offices are already uh, stated there. Uh, the appointments, uh, the chancellor of the Church of Nigeria remains Honorable Henry Odein Ajimogabia, SAA. And also, I want to inform the General Synod that the uh, term of the General Secretary has elapsed and we are hereby renewing his term by another Synod of three years. You will also see the directorates that are in the office of the Primate, the Director for uh, for youth, for mission and evangelism, justice and equity, peace and reconciliation, theological matters, uh, women and children, and I will add their main. And uh, we also have the directorate for civil, civic and political affairs, and uh, which is also handling the issues of publications. We also have the uh, directorate for protocol, the rhetoric for media and communication, and the rhetoric for spirituality. And uh, I also want to add there the rhetoric for foreign missions and the rhetoric for medical, health, welfare, relief, and community uh, engagement. The present directors will function on acting capacity pending a review by the Standing Committee in February 2024. Our statutory boards and, the com and the committees of the Church of Nigeria, the Board of Trustees, the Board of Trinity Foundation, the Board of Mission and of the Church of Nigeria, the uh, CNMS and the National Missions and the Foreign Missions, the Board of SCNN uh, television, uh, this will be reconstituted. The Board of Governors Crowder Graduate Theological Seminary, 
the Implementation Committee for the Anglican University of Technology, Peta Abuja, Church of Nigeria Alternative Dispute Resolution, Ebly a Committee, Ebly led by Honorable Justice Abraham uh, George Will. This they have done noble work. Um, Church of Nigeria Committee of Reference, and then Church of Nigeria Relief, Welfare, and Community uh, Engagement. Our evangelical tradition and liturgical heritage, please pay attention. The Church of Nigeria was founded through the missionary enterprise of the CMS, which was started, which started missions in 1842. The CMS was founded by the Evangelical Anglicans in England, and as such, the Church of Nigeria was bequeathed and was founded on the evangelical traditions of the Anglican Church. The the evangelical traditions are true to the ideals of the Reformation. The Reformations and the historical formularies of the church. Thus, the creeds, the Book of Common Prayer, the 39 Articles of Religion, and holds strongly to the authority of the scripture and the lifestyle and the worship of the church we, and, and lifestyle and missions which accords to the Holy Scriptures. The liturgy and worship of the church is said to be the dramatization of the Scriptures. Like the apostolic and ancient church, the church of Nigeria is called to proclaim faithfully the Lordship of Jesus Christ and to celebrate the sacraments of the grace of God. The centrality of the scripture in the teachings, worship, missions, and ministry of the, of the church should not be compromised. The proclamation of the gospel of the kingdom and the lordship of Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior of the world, is the ultimate task of the church. As we reach out to the world and our generation, bound in sin with the love of God and saving power of God in the gospel, we do so in holistic mission. Therefore, the, life, the ministry of the church is rooted in the Bible, Christ-centered and family-focused. All who are called to serve God in the church serve within the three orders of ministry as deacons, priests, and bishops. In the ordering of the worship of the church, these ministers are to use the Book of Common Prayer as approved by the Synod of the Church of Nigeria. The importation of Romish mass liturgical practices such as burning of incense or other practices are not permitted. The practices and the indoctrination of the use of or sale of special candles, holy water, or special apparel or handkerchief, or consulting of mediums, or reverence for special relics or objects are not allowed. We stand in this, that we are saved by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ by the grace of God. The Holy Scriptures and the Catechisms of the Church, the 39 Articles of Religion, and indeed the Book of Common Prayer have given us sufficient guidelines in, on, what, on who we are, 
and what we should do. The burning of incense or other Romish, Roma, Romish practices or acts during the Holy Communion changes the Anglican understanding of the Eucharist. The priest does not offer any sacrifice to God at the communion because Jesus Christ offered himself once and for all, for all times on the cross. He died and rose and he lives forever. Again, the elements in the Holy Communion service, which is the body and blood of Christ represented by the bread and, and the wine, are not to be received, sorry, are to be received, sorry, are to be received by faith with thankful heart for the redemption Christ Jesus gave us. At the consecration of the elements, they do not transform into the real body and blood of Jesus at the sound of the, of the jingle of the bell. Therefore, transform, transubstantiation overthrows the very nature of a sacrament and has given occasion for many superstitions. The new Book of Common Prayer provides for the use of chasubles, tassock herbs, and other vestments at, as an accommodation, but not a wholesome copying of the Romish sacramental practice. The vestments are for dignity and honor in the leading of the worship of God's people. The best is to keep within our evangelical heritage. Excesses are not allowed. Moratorium, moratorium in the creation of new dioceses. The moratorium in the creation of new dioceses was renewed during the 13th General Synod in Abuja. This was necessitated by the fact that many of the missionary dioceses are still struggling to su sustain their missions and oppressions. While these problems are still with us, there is need for us to review the situation with a view to seeing the possibilities, the possibility of creating some new dioceses in the deserving areas for the purpose of mission and growth of the church of God. This will be under the following clear guide, guidelines and conditions and other things that will be laid out. One, the new, one, no new diocese shall be created out of rancor, quarrel, Disputes or ambition of some groups. Two, the fundamental due process and constitutional requirements shall be followed through a resolution passing through the relinquishing diocese. Three, the viability of the new and the relinquishing diocese in Funding, sustainability, mission, and mission must be guaranteed. Four, provision of a fully furnished and equipped bishop's court. Five, having a well-built church that will serve as cathedral or pro-cathedral as the headquarters of the diocese and a functional diocesan secretariat. Six, procurement of an appropriate vehicle for the bishop to be packed in the residence of the archbishop of the province from which the diocese will be created. Seven, a deposit of the sum of 50 million naira into 
a designated Church of Nigeria account and or a shorty of 20 million naira for three to five years paid into a designated account of the Church of Nigeria for missionary diocese and such other conditions as the General Synod may wish to put after due inspection by such committees as may be constituted for this purpose. And finally, General Synod may approve just a periodic lifting of the moratorium for one synod. And this will be renewed or reviewed from synod to synod. This will help us to monitor and give guidance on the creation of sustainable dioceses in the Church of Nigeria Anglican Communion. Missions and evangelism and discipleship remains our major task and focus. The Church of Nigeria Missionary Society, CNMS, is waxing strong. When you get the address, you will see all there. And we thank God for their labor. Um, October is hereby being declared the mission month for the Church of Nigeria. The CNMS has planned the mission program covering the month of October, which will culminate in the graduation and commissioning of the first batch of our mission partners trained in Bishop Ajay Crowder uh, Mission Institute in Oshogo uh, this uh, October. We request that dioceses and provinces will that you participate fully in the mission activities. Dioceses, dioceses that need mission partners should also indicate interest for the posting of our newly trained uh, mission partners. The nomadic mission is being enlarged to incorporate the diaspora mission uh, expert and uh, we thank God that the Bishop of Ica hosted our maiden uh, mission conference focusing on this aspect. We thank God for the Joshua Generation Mission, the mission to the youth. Um, in fact, it was a great success. Uh, the third edition was held at Moshid Abiola National Stadium, Abuja, from 10th to 15th of April this year. And we had over 22,000 young people physically present. It was wonderful. And uh, we have mapped out eight ways of ministering, continuing ministering to them. And we have trained about 70 youths in Christian uh, drama, cinematography, and script writing, and others, production of movies. And the amazing movie will be uh, will be premiered this evening um, as we round up the proceedings of the day. We solicit for uh, we have also established a national football club for the young people in the Anglican Church. We are following up the processes in the uh, Nigerian Football Federation to register this national team. And um, we want to also bring to your notice that God is using Joshua generation to touch the lives of our young people. Many gave their lives, 
many responded to mission awareness and we are trusting God for better things that God will do through our young people. Amen. But let me share with you that one of the greatest need we have is to have people who will mentor them professionally, spiritually, and otherwise. And if the Lord will open up a, an opportunity for you to be used of God, to mentor them in politics, in commerce, in, in law, in other professions, these young people are looking for the flag to follow. We will fail them. God forbid. May we be available to raise the next generation. Amen. Foreign missions. Church of Nigeria, North American Mission, Konam, is the continuation of Kana, our initial mission organ in North America. The Church of Nigeria mission in North America was a rescue mission to provide a safe haven for Nigerian Anglicans living in Ecusa and Tech Church because of the revisionist, homosexual, and other aberrations, erroneous, heretical teachings of our time. The Church of Nigeria is not interested in expansionist move in North America or Canada. We only maintain a pedagogical presence with our brothers and sisters over there. We stand there to encourage and enable them to be faithful Christians and also to share our convictions on the authority of the scripture, faithfulness to the leader, to the lordship of Jesus Christ, and also our Anglican heritage as we have received it, and to share in fellowship. We have appointed Bishop Nathan Kalu to be the coordinator, coordinating or supervising bishop for Kuna. Since 2020, we have been having a running battle with ACNA, and this has not been funny. And their crowds has been that we have created autonomous dioceses or jurisdictions outside the province of the Church of Nigeria. It is therefore necessary that we revert and maintain the mission status of our operations in North America and Canada. The bishops and the priests will be accountable for the mission and the evangelism and the planting of church in the areas assigned to them. We have also allowed Bishop Oji Felix to go to SCNA. And we have also continued to engage leadership of SCNA in some issues that are of mutual benefit and, and interest. We are still not out of the woods, and yet and that we will continue to pursue the path of fellowship, of partnership, and mission with our sister province in America. We have suffered disturbing negative media assaults on our person and the priests and bishops of this church. And indeed, the Church of Nigeria. That we see this as part of the cost to pay for the Lord. At the heart of this problem is the issue of jurisdiction and having autonomous dioceses or jurisdictions outside Nigeria. We have signed some protocols which the present leadership of ACNA 
do not want to work with and are insisting that we should not work in their own jurisdiction. Uh, we are still working out, uh, working to solve these issues. Let us make it clear that the Church of Nigeria will not abandon our members and our churches or hand them over to any organization. Konam remains the mission of the Church of Nigeria. There are so many ripe mission fields and opportunities in North America and beyond. Some of our people have gone out to other Nigerian churches, yet there is still much more to be done among different nationalities and groups. We need to work in partnership with other missions and other groups that are mission-minded. Following this, there is need for us to develop a Church of Nigeria policy for foreign missions. There is a fundamental principle in the Anglican Church ministry that has to do with jurisdiction. This issue of jurisdiction affects areas of ministerial oppressions from the local parish to the diocese and to the national provincial church levels. It is an Anglican convention to have a chaplaincy or missions or convocation in jurisdictions other than your own. But there will be a need for partnership and collaboration with sister provinces where such missions and convocations exist. We shall explore this possibility in America, UK, Europe, and in administering our growing foreign missions. To this end, this General Synod will take a decision on the modus operandi of our, mission, our foreign missions, which will be in line with the constitution and canons of the Church of Nigeria and the accepted Anglican Convention and practice. Our global strategy will be focused on remaining on the remaining half of the world and that has yet to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. And therefore we recommend new missionaries shall not only target Nigerians abroad, but also see that indigenous, indigenous people among whom they live or reside as their primary focus. Two, foreign missionary candidates shall emerge from Nigerians at home, Nigerians in diaspora, and the Anglican Communion worldwide. Three, partnership for church planting shall be forged with willing partners and people within the communion. Prayer does not exclude planning. And before entering a new mission field, appropriate consideration should be given to the issues relating to the specific nature of such location, bearing in mind the necessary, the necessity to start well and finish strong. We are trusting God that by 2025, the Church of Nigeria Anglican Communion will host missions, world missions consultation. We have already started praying for this and working towards it. And uh, by the grace of God, we are going to partner with national and regional mission agencies and partners 
to organize this strategic world mission consultation. Amen. We have our missions in UK and Europe is growing. Uh, we have missions in UK, Japan, Gulf, Asia countries, and South America and other parts of the world. And we are trusting God that the Lord will help us to grow these mission fields. Uh, Bishop Ben Ewuchola has been appointed the coordinator for missions in UK and Europe. And uh, he traveled around Europe and uh, established or uh, commissioned new churches in different countries. We shall be appointing chaplains to these countries. Amen. Bishop's Intentional Discipleship Cohort, you will see that as you get your uh, the address. We have trained 72 bishops and wives and we are recruiting a new team that will start for 2024. And um, sundry issues. We celebrated our 180 years of uh, Christianity and Anglicanism in Nigeria. This was done in Adagri in December 17 and 18, 2022. And uh, by February 24th, 2024, we shall be clocking 45 years as an independent national church. The Church of Nigeria Anglican Communion, the province of Nigeria will be 45 next year, February 24th. Uh, February 24th. And uh, the planning committee for this celebration will work out the modalities. The, we have also established Church of Nigeria Holy Pilgrimage Committee headed by Archbishop Odutemu. Uh, he will be addressing the synod during uh, the plenaries. All are said. And by December this year, the first batch will be going on pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Amen. Uh, the Church of Nigeria Award Committee are working. Uh, these eminent committee members are working and by the grace of God, by the next standing committee, uh, we may see what they come up with. And uh, we thank God. The Diocese on the Niger has written us to raise some historical issues and uh, we are looking into that and we are putting in place a competent team or committee that will look into this matter and report appropriately. The general ministries, when you get it, you see the work of the women's, women's ministry, uh, the men's ministry, uh, the Christian men's fellowship, the national convention leading on to the election of the substantive team uh, that will lead this fellowship nationwide will be held next year, 2024. Um, the work of AFAC and AYF is progressing. When you get your address, you will see what they are doing. Children and Young People Ministry, ACM, we are grateful for all our coordinators for these ministries. But for this general synod, I want to announce to us that there has been an outcry for the, the church to seek friends and teach our boy child who will grow up to be the man and the father of homes and leaders in church and our society. To this end, we hereby establish Operation Samuel Mission. We direct and encourage all our dioceses and provinces to provide special groups and fellowships to nurture 
and to train our young boys. So we encourage all our provinces for, to do this to provide spiritual and social nurture for this boy child in all our churches. And as you do so, may God nurture our children. And as David prayed that our sons will grow up in their youth and our daughters be like pillars in palaces in the name of Jesus. Anglican students ministry in tertiary institutions. And um, we are working out a process and by the grace of God, by next year, we will be having one Anglican ministry body that is ministering to our young people in all our uh, higher institutions nationwide. Uh, that has been already been declared and we are working out the details and by the grace of God by next year we will conclude on this and a formidable team in place. Funding the mission and ministries of this church, we have launched a 5 billion Naira mission trust fund and the we thank God for those who have contributed to this fund. And out of this fund, the University of Technology, Anglican University of Technology, being built at Kweta in Abuja, is being executed. The missions of the church and other ways of strengthening the institutions of our church will come through this fund. And uh, health welfare and community engagement uh, we are trusting God that by the grace of God we are going to establish a church of Nigeria outreach team in fact we are putting in place a steering committee um, who will be inaugurated on the uh, on Wednesday, the 11th of October, 2023. And we are demanding of them that they help us bring together a team of our Anglican health professionals, doctors, nurses, uh, pharmacists, and uh, other medical practitioners who will help us to one, transform our existing church-owned mission hospitals and clinics. Two, we need to reinvigorate, revamp, and reposition our health training institutions while establishing more. We need to have Christian mission tertiary health facilities of repute in different parts of this church within the next five years. We need to establish a Church of Nigeria HMO that will cater for ordinary members, especially those in rural and deprived communities. The health and welfare of the people are important to God and to this church. And therefore, we send forth this Macedonian call to all Anglicans who are a medical profession and by next year you are going to um, have uh, your maiden conference that will be on Thursday 14th to, uh, to Saturday 16th of March 2024, and that will be at St. Matthias House, our National Secretariat, Gudu, Abuja. So, we are looking forward to that gathering from where more of the things that we need to do to help the church and our members, and indeed to rebuild our health sector in Nigeria. Amen. The 
time CNN, our television station will be marking her 10th year anniversary on Monday the 2nd of October 2023. This will hold in St. Matthias House, Abuja. And uh, we want to thank all our dioceses and members who have been patronizing this station and still request that your, your support will continue and we encourage as many of our dioceses to uh, engage uh, our station. We thank the chairman of the board, uh, Chief Lamiti, and the members of the board of uh, ACNN. And uh, going forward, we are we are constituting a premature media advisory team as follows. Prince John Momo, Chief Benga Adebayo, Sir Folusho Olamiti, and the Most Reverend Dr. Lesne Ninda. These will be the primatial media advisory team. And we are also reconstituting the SCNN uh, board as follows. The Right Reverend Chid Oparojiaku as chairman, Chief Benga Adebayo as vice chairman, the Venerable Shadari as member, Barrister Yusuf Pam as member, Dr. Peter S. Madu as member, Lady Cordelia Mwonu Ukwoma as member, and the treasurer of the Church of Nigeria. We have also established the Anglican Global Matters team uh, made up of our career diplomats and those uh, in international uh, services um, to help us um, in some global matters. GAFCON 4, Kigali, in Rwanda. When you look at the appendix, you will see uh, the uh, GAFCON commitment. And also, I want to bring to our note that the Church of Nigeria is also planning to build the Anglican uh, Conference Center and the Institute for this church in Abuja, when you look at pages 98 to 99 of uh, your of this of the address, you will see uh, some of the uh, architectural designs for this national conference center. We need it in order to host all the national conferences of this church. Um, the team of architects and engineers have uh, put together as the design team and they have worked. The proceeds of this, the launching of today's charge or address and the collections of Advent collections for the next three years will be dedicated to building and developing this conference center. But we also will welcome support and contribution from our members and friends in order to see that we achieve this task. Our target is that by the year 2026, the member of this center will be put to use. Please support us to get this done. We need it for the Joshua generation. We need it for DIFCON. We need it for the conferences, AYF, EFAC, and all our national conferences we hold in this place. And we are planning to build a conference center that will take the capacity of about 20 to 25 
thousand participants. Please help us to bring this forth. Um, there are uh, still so much on education, on theological education and ministerial formation and uh, by this general synod we are inaugurating or we are instituting theological commission for the church of Nigeria. This commission will guide the implementation of the report of the theological consultation and regulate the establishment of operation, operation and operations of theological and pastoral training institutions institutions within the church. A situation in which individuals or dioceses go all out to establish their own so-called theological colleges or Bible, Bible schools and set their own standards and award their own diplomas and even some are already advertising for BTH programs cannot be accepted in this church. Because of our new constitutional minimum requirement for bishops who are to be elected is now BTH. We are now experiencing a situation in which some of our clergy collude with some theological institutions to do a two-month program and graduate with a BTH. Such desperate moves are not acceptable and will not, will not help the growth of the church. And we shall de register such theological colleges that are found to be operating such cheap degree programs. We will not recognize such degrees for ministerial ordinations. Prouder Graduate Theological Seminary, Yokuta. We thank God for what they are doing, and uh, we have given them the task to train missionaries that will go to the Francophone countries for mission. Right now, they are training about eight people, eight postlands that are being trained for such mission to the Francophone countries. We have also re received requests from Central Af African countries asking us to allow them to send their students to be trained in that place. Our senior clergy training team headed by the new dean are working. And our all clergy conference will hold by next year. Our clergy postgraduate scholarship scheme is still on. Our bishop's training is still on. But we are hoping that by the grace of God, we will have advanced bishop's training uh, program. We have appointed the Most Reverend Dr. Friday Emahai and the Most Reverend Dr. Emmanuel Egunu as coordinators for our bishops training. Building peace and reconciliation. We thank God for the Honorable Justice Abraham George Will. Uh, committee of uh, Alternative Dispute Resolution Tax Force or committee, they have done noble in resolving some of our problems and challenges in dioceses. We are still working to resettle some of our clergy, priests, and others that are returning from the Orthodox Church. And we are asking uh, bishops and uh, to work together with uh, Archbishop Amao's team to 
in order to sort out every outstanding issues. Church of Nigeria Investments, the Church of Nigeria app is up and running, but still needs more work. CSS Bookshop Limited, in the course of this uh, General Synod, we will be receiving report from the board chair, uh, Professor Olaruwaju, and also the restructuring and uh, um, restoring team headed by uh, Mazi Sam Ohuabungwa who will be speaking to us. Church of Nigeria Publications is going on and we thank God for the for the progress, but yet we want to appeal to all our bishops and that bishops to please book for your uh, publications. Um, we are hoping to print the book of common prayer and the Church of Nigeria hymn book into one book and uh, arrangements are on. We will inform you to book, make your book out. Um, prayer mobilization, ecumenical matters, and others. We just received from the CCN president for Nigeria, one of our own, at Bishop uh, David Onoha, uh, the new president of CCN. And uh, we want to ask all our bishops and churches to support the work of CCN and CAN. We have been appointed or elected into the Central Committee of the WCC. And uh, during our WCC conference uh, in Geneva this year, um, we, the most reverend Dr. Michael Fakbe was appointed also as a member of the Faith and Order Commission of the WCC. Uh, the WCC member churches and the uh, CCN will be hosting two important world conferences in November. From November 8th to 16th, we will be hosting the WCC Executive Committee meeting in Abuja. And from 17th to 24th, we will be hosting the AACC uh, conference in Abuja. The Anglican Church is playing a very key role, and we ask for your prayers and support. In our ecumenical initiatives, we have established Anglican Roman Catholic Commission, uh, which is headed by Most Reverend Dr. Michael Fakpe. We have also the Anglican uh, and African Church Commission. We have the Anglican Methodist Church Commission, uh, which is headed by uh, the Most Reverend Dr. Alexander Bezim as a co-chair. And Michael Pape is co-chair. Um, we are also working out a, a plan, a way of partnering with the uh, Anglican province of the Church of West Africa, um, which the Archbishop is fully represented here by our brother, the Bishop of uh, Cameroon. Uh, we are looking at the possibility of working out uh, a way in which we can collaborate and work together. Uh, we have put in place a joint task force 
for the West African province, uh, our brother, the Bishop of uh, Cameroon, is the co-chair. And from our own side, uh, our, our Father in God, the Most Reverend Joseph Akinfemwa, is the co-chair. This joint team are working um, to see how we can collaborate with mission and ministry. Our appreciation, sorry, before then, St. Matthias and Advent Collections, we want to uh, thank all our dioceses and bishops for responding, and we still request that you keep supporting this Church of Nigeria Collections, uh, which has, which have been a source of support financially to our mission and ministry. <clears throat> appreciation. We give thanks and praise to the almighty God for his guidance and leading in the work and activities of the Church of Nigeria during the 13th Synod. We are grateful indeed to all who have served God and his church so sacrificially at various levels. The archbishops and bishops, the archbishops and bishops' wives, the presidents of women ministry, the officials of the Church of Nigeria, and all God's people. We must thank Secretary, the General Secretary of the Church of Nigeria, Venerable Dr. Paul Keshnan Dajo, who has served us so sacrificially. The legal officers, the treasurers, the directors of our directories, we must thank particularly the immediate past dean of the Church of Nigeria, the most reverend Dr. Amama Alibuba Lamido. We are indeed very grateful. And uh, for their meritorious service to this church, for standing with us and for piloting the activities of this church, we thank the chancellor of this church, Honorable Henry then at Mogobia for his wise counsel and guidance at all times. The registrar, barrister, Dr. Abraham Yisa, a true servant of God, who has labored selflessly for this church under the most reverend Peter Jasper Akiola and the most reverend Dr. Nicholas D. Oko, and also with us. He has seen it all and knows so much about this institution. We thank the treasurer, Mrs. Yemi Dada, whose humility and doggedness in faithful service with her team have been a source of great treasure to God's kingdom. We thank all our directors and chairmen of committees and tax forces and teams. And boards. God will surely remember you, bless you richly, and increase the fruit of your righteousness. We rejoice with all our new bishops, archbishops, the new dean of the Church of Nigeria, and we are also uh, congratulating those who have retired, both archbishops and bishops. We are also welcoming the new bishops and their wives and we stand with all our members who have lost their dear ones. We have also lost some of our serving bishops and some of our retired bishops. When you get the uh, address, you will see the list. And our prayer is that the Lord will grant those who have gone into glory, eternal rest, and their families, the fortitude to bear the loss. Just first of September, we lost his mama Gladys Emerson, the assistant president of the Diocese of Benin. The burial is being fixed towards the end of this month. Please pray for 
Bishop Peter Maxwell. The hosting of the Standing Committee meetings of the Church of Nigeria 2024 to 2025. For February 5th to 9th, 2024, we shall be going to the Diocese of Eka. September 16th to September 20th, 2024, we shall be going to the Diocese of Remo. And in February 2025, we shall be going to the Diocese of Niger Delta. And September 2025, we shall be going to the Diocese of Amici. In conclusion, Nehemiah saw beyond the physical devastation of the walls and the bond gates to the spiritual, emotional, social, moral destruction of the foundations of the society, which brought reproach and distress. When core values are eroded and the moral conscience is destroyed, the people will lack the will to stand. And as the scripture says, if the foundations are destroyed, what will the righteous do? And as we face the myriad of challenges in our time and generation, both in the church, family, and the society, the mandate of God to us is to rise up and build. We need to rebuild the broken foundations and the walls and secure the gates of our lives, the family, the mission, and the ministry of the church, and then become a spiritual, moral, and the prophetic voice of God in this nation and in our world. May the God of grace and power be with you. Maranatha, peace be with you. We'll celebrate God's servant, our father, the primate of the Church of Nigeria. Can we celebrate God, celebrate God, celebrate God. Thank you. Can I hear you again celebrate God's grace upon our father, the primate? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. You may have your seat. Thank you.